This is my second video <laughs> update. I wanted to show everybody the the uh, the seaside and the Zongolopoulos, Yorgos George Zongolopoulos, the famous umbrellas from a famous Greek sculptor, the umbrellas of Thessaloniki. It's a fantastic piece of art and uh, very famous. Everyone comes and they take their photos underneath the umbrellas. Steel. They're steel umbrellas. And, uh, this is one of the famous tourist attractions. A fun tourist attraction here in Thessaloniki. But let's talk about some news stories. And um, we have got to get to... What are we going to talk about today? We've got to get to this article from The Guardian. An incredible article coming out of The Guardian. And uh, we'll talk about how Biden is throwing Alensky under the bus. We'll talk about that as well. And uh, what else should we do? We'll do a good clown world. And um, let me think. Are there any other news stories here that I want to talk about? We actually we may have like two clown worlds <laughs> that we want to uh, that we want to get to. Oh, we have uh, Germany sending weapons to Ukraine, but a very interesting story there with the weapons that Germany's sending and uh, and the new G8 is forming a new G8 with some very interesting countries that are going to be in this new G8 but uh, let's get into this uh, Guardian article and you know I'm going to probably read you most of this article because it's it's pretty incredible what the Guardian is saying and it, it falls it falls in line with what uh, I've been saying for a while now what uh, what Alexander has been saying, what we at the Duran have been saying, what a lot of people in this uh, in this new space has, has been saying for a while, which is that uh, the collective West is looking for an off ramp, and the media is now pushing out stories about how uh, how things are not going well in Ukraine, and um, it's not looking good, and everyone should prepare for a Ukraine loss to the Russians. And uh, I, I call this trickle truth. That's what I like to call this because for three months, the, uh, the citizens of the collective West has, have been hearing nonstop stories about how the Russian army was getting demolished, how Ukraine was uh, crushing the Russian military, how Putin's uh, war in Ukraine was a disaster, that Putin is ill and he's suffering from all kinds of uh, ailments showing you heart attacks, Russian generals being murdered every single day, 10 Russian generals being taken out every single day, and how, in general, you were looking at uh, a military, economic, societal collapse in Russia. Well, the reverse is now playing out, and the facts on the ground are so desperate for the Ukraine military and for the Alensky regime that uh, the collective West media they have to find an off-ramp and they have to start kind of trickling the truth out to the public. Slowly, slowly getting them used to the, the fact that Ukraine is, uh, is crumbling and they are indeed losing this uh, military conflict and it's not looking good for the economies of the collective West either. And uh, instead of just coming out with the news stories all at once, you had the first news story from the Washington Post Remember that story about like two weeks ago? I actually did a, a nighttime video in Athens and I was walking from Ammonia to, uh, to Sindagma Square. And I remember I was talking about that story. That was the first story that uh, the collective West globalists decided to, uh, to put out there. And I said during that video, watch, after this uh, Washington Post story admitting that uh, Ukraine is losing, you're not gonna have all of the collective West puppet publications coming out with stories slowly slowly coming out with stories talking about the the real facts on the ground in uh, in Ukraine and of course they massage everything you know so it's not 100% the truth maybe it's like 60 70 percent of the way there but slowly slowly trickle truth they're getting uh, the citizens of the collective West used to uh, to what's what's coming soon which is going to be some sort of uh, of collapse in uh, in Ukraine. So let's get to this uh, Guardian article here. And I'm just gonna I'm gonna read you most of it. <laughs> like I said, it's a pretty short article, but the title says Ukraine's high casualty rate could bring war to a tipping point. Could bring war to a tipping point. Any way you count it, 
the figures are stark. Ukrainian casualties are running at a rate of somewhere between 600 to 1,000 a day. One presidential advisor, Oletsky Aristovich, told The Guardian this week it was 150 and 800 wounded daily. Another, Mikhailo Podoliak, told the BBC that 100 to 200 Ukrainian troops a day were being killed. It represents an extraordinary loss of human life and capacity for the defenders embroiled in a defense of the eastern city of Severodonetsk that this week turned into a losing battle. Yet the city was also arguably a place that Ukraine could have retreated from to the more defendable Lizichansk across the Siversky Donetsk River, the sort of defense situation that Ukraine has fared far better in. Have we not been telling you this for like the last two, two weeks? I mean, we've been saying this for like, like the last two weeks, Guardian. We've been telling you this, that uh, Severe Donetsk was, uh, was a lost cause and Elensky should retreat to Lizichansk, but Elensky would not listen to his generals. And he said, no, stay and fight. And then you had the BS story, the concocted BS Ukraine, Alensky propaganda piece that Severodonetsk was uh, retaken back by the Ukraine military. Anyway, let's continue. The sheer number, more than 20,000 casualties a month, raises questions about what state Ukraine's army will be in if the war drags on into the autumn. The same is true for the Russians, too. Listen, remember, remember this line. The same is true for the Russians, too, of course. Just remember that. But the invaders already control large chunks of Ukraine, and they can pause the fighting with the territorial upper hand. The territorial upper hand. That's an interesting choice of words. Consider the figures in context. Ukraine's army was 125,000 strong, according to the International Institute of Strategic Studies. And there were 102,000 national and border guards. In addition, analysts Crude estimates suggest that since the start of the war, the total could have doubled to an impressive 500,000. Kiev's forces are far from a point of collapse, but several months of high casualties will erode its fighting strength significantly, even if allowing for some of the wounded to recover. Meanwhile, Ukraine's forces are already being pushed back in the Donbass artillery bombardment. So intense, it is likely to have a shell shock impact on many of those who survive it. Morale is certainly an issue for the Russians. Remember that line, morale is certainly an issue for the Russians, but there are now reports of desertions from the Ukraine side too. So you see how they're kind of, you know, throwing in there as they're talking about the Ukraine collapse, the military collapse in Ukraine, they have to throw in there, you know, so, so it's the same for the Russians as well. The casualties are high for Ukraine, but it's the same for the Russians as well. Morale is low for Ukraine's, for Ukraine, but it's the same for the Russians as well. They have to put those qualifiers in there, but... I'm pointing that out to you because you're going to see what The Guardian says in, uh, in the next few paragraphs. So pressing is the situation that foreigners with combat experience who pass the test to join the International Legion could be on the front line in less than a month after crossing the Ukrainian border. But again, the high level of casualties now being openly discussed may act as a deterrent to recruits in the future. Western, and I'm sure the, the Donetsk trial is not going to help those foreign fighters as well. Um, Western officials prefer not to discuss the impact of the war on the defenders, instead highlighting the problems for the Russians in their briefings. This week, one of those officials said their estimate was that the invaders had lost 15 to 20,000 dead out of an invasion force that was 150,000 or more. Yet despite this, Moscow's army has still not lost its offensive capability. But they chose not to provide similar estimates for Ukraine, which can create a lopsided impression that the Russians are faring worse. In fact, with an artillery overmatch of 10 to 15, of 10 or 15 to 1, according to the Ukrainians, it may well be that the invaders, they use the word invaders often, the invaders, casualty rate is far lower at the moment because they are able to deal with, to deal death from a greater distance to defenders who cannot see them. They are able to deal death from a greater distance to defenders who cannot see them. Was the American military, were they called invaders when they went into Iraq by the, by the uh, Guardian? I don't remember. Ammunition is certainly running short on the Ukrainian side. Again, by their own admission, commanders have told the Guardian that Ukraine struggles for some basic equipment, such as encrypted radios or advanced 
sights and optics of the types commonly used by Western militaries. So more weapons. We need to get more weapons to Ukraine. And Ukraine is short on bravery, is, is not short on bravery and determination. Western support is still in place. It's crumbling, it's crumbling, as shown by the UK's announcement to supply a handful of perhaps three multiple rocket launchers this week, even if Kiev said almost immediately that it wanted many times more. But it is Russia's forces that have found a way to advance in the Donbass, raising the question of whether the three-month war is at another turning point. So it's really interesting how they say that the Russians are pretty much suffering a parody with regards to casualties, but then they say that the Russians are kind of not suffering a parody with regards to uh, the artillery war because they have an artillery outmatch of 10 to 15. And then they say that um, the casualty rate for the Russians, for the invaders, they don't say the Russians. Let me read you this line again. It may well be that the invaders, i.e. the Russians, casualty rate is far lower at the moment because they are able to deal death from a greater distance to defenders who cannot see them. So in the beginning of the article, the Guardian was saying that while morale is low for the Ukrainians, while the casualties are high for the Ukrainians, the same holds true for the Russians. But then way, way down in the article, they say that because the Russians are uh, overmatching Ukraine with, uh, with artillery of 10 or 15 times to one, most likely the Russian casualty rates are far lower. But they don't call them Russians, they say invaders. They say invaders because they don't want to say the Russian casualty rate is low compared to Ukraine. So that's the article from The uh, Guardian. And you can see how uh, a, a lot of the deceptive language that they use, a lot of the, the kind of, uh, you know, whatever's happening to Ukraine is happening to the Russians, but then way down towards the end of the article, they kind of say, well, actually Russia is outmatching Ukraine 15 to one, and most likely because it's an artillery war being waged at a great distance, the casualty rates for Russians may be much lower, maybe. They always use these qualifiers in there. But uh, Joe, Joe Biden, Joe Biden is actually also throwing Elensky under the bus. The writing's on the wall for Ukraine. The collective West is trying to find a way to ditch you. I'm telling you, Ukraine, they are trying to find a way to ditch you guys. Um, they led you into this terrible, destructive conflict, and they told you you're going to get into the EU and NATO, and you're going to be driving, every, every Ukrainian citizen's going to be driving a Mercedes Benz, and you're going to be living in mansions, and... Everything's going to be fantastic once you get into the EU. And now they're, uh, they're looking to ditch you. And they're looking to ditch you quickly. So Potato Head Biden, Bidenopoulos, said that uh, he warned Alensky of the, of the Russian invasion in, uh, way back in February. But he said Alensky would not listen. Alensky wasn't listening to him. He said, nothing like this has happened since World War II. This is what he told the Associated Press. Nothing like this has happened since World War II. I know a lot of people thought... Argo, the Argo boat. <laughs> anyway, um, I know a lot of people thought I, I was maybe exaggerating, Biden said, according to the Associated Press. He added that the U.S. had data that showed Russian President Vladimir Putin was going to invade. There was no doubt Biden continued, and Alensky didn't want to hear it. And Alensky didn't want to hear it. He actually said that Alensky was even telling him to calm down the messaging. So he's blaming Alensky for this uh, for this war and they're blaming Alensky for a lot of things now like I said they're uh, they're looking to uh, to ditch the Ukraine potato potato head Biden is looking to ditch the Ukraine hot potato because things are going so bad in the United States with regards to fuel prices and the economy and inflation they just uh, they don't want to deal with Ukraine it's obvious they've, they've lost and they don't want to deal with it and they want to move on, as does much of the, uh, the EU. And so they're trying to blame everything now on Alensky. This follows the New York Times article, which ran just a couple of days ago, which said that if Alensky and his commanders would listen to, uh, to the Biden White House and the U.S. commanders, then they would be winning this war. But the U.S. commanders, they have no idea what's going on in Ukraine, and they don't they don't run the Ukraine military and they're not in charge of Ukraine decisions and that's why Ukraine is losing so badly to Russia. That was just two, three days ago. Now you have the story 
from uh, Biden to the Associated Press saying, we warned Zelensky that this was coming and he didn't listen to us, so he's at fault. He's to blame for all of this. Everyone else is to blame except NATO, the EU, Ursula van der Crazy, and Joe Bidenopoulos. And uh, Germany, Germany is looking for a way out of this as well. I've talked about how Germany is trying to, uh, to not send its good weapons to Ukraine. They don't want to send any weapons to Ukraine, uh, as a matter of fact, but they're saying we're not going to send them our good stuff because uh, according to Der Spiegel, the publication in Germany, if uh, Olaf Scholz sends the good stuff to Ukraine, then Ukraine, once again, they're going to win the war and they're going to march on Moscow and all of these great things are going to happen. And, you know, we just can't have the optics of having German tanks invading Moscow again. They don't want those optics. So that's why they're not going to send Alensky the good weapons. But they are going to send Alensky supposedly their really good Iris, um, I believe their anti-air anti defense system. And uh, they're going to send that to uh, Alensky from what I hear in October. That's the latest with regards to this IRIS system that they say is up there with, uh, with the Patriot uh, missile system. But they're going to send that in October. So, yeah, <laughs> I think you understand what the Germans are telling the Ukrainians. But they are going to send Ukraine. And this is the, a weird story because on the one hand, you have their Spiegel saying that we don't want German tanks invading Russia again if we send uh, Elensky our really, really super-duper good weapons because he's just going to crush the Russian military with those super-duper good German weapons. And then he's going to invade Russia, and we don't want any of that happening with German weapons. But now you're getting the report from the Ukraine ambassador in Germany, who's a real nutcase. He's the guy that called uh, Olaf Schultz, uh, not a sultry, I always say sultry, but a sulky liver sausage. He's the one that constantly, every week, he's making fun of Germany and he's making fun of Olaf Scholz and Olaf Scholz just kind of takes it. Every week he is making fun of Germany, the Ukrainian ambassador in Germany. And, you know, the German government just sits there and says, yeah, yeah, no problem. Just keep on uh, denigrating us and making fun of us. We're just going to take it. But uh, this is coming from the, uh, the Ukraine ambassador in Germany. And uh, they are saying now, he is saying, and various media outlet, outlets are saying that uh, the German military is now going to send weapons to Ukraine and the date that they're going to send them on is pretty interesting. June 22nd is the date that they're going to send howitzers. PZH-2000 howitzers are being promised by the German Defense Ministry and according to the Ukraine ambassador in Germany, Andrei Melnik, to uh, Ukraine. And they will get these systems, according to the Ukraine ambassador, on the 22nd of June. The 22nd of June. So Der Spiegel said that Germany is not going to send their really good weapons out of fears that Alensky is going to invade Moscow with those German tanks and those German weapons. And they don't want those types of optics, given uh, the history of World War II. But yet they're going to send howitzers and a small number of howitzers, from what I understand. And they're going to send those on the 22nd of June. This is from Christine Lambrecht, the German defense minister. The 22nd of June, the date named by the ambassador of Ukraine and Germany, was the very date that Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union in 1941. Yeah. So, uh, so much for optics and World War II optics in German, USSR World War II optics. So there you see that the Der Spiegel story with Olaf Scholz and the weapons was BS because the Germans are, uh, they know what they're doing. They know the symbolism. The collective West understands the symbolism of sending weapons on June 22nd for the Ukraine NAZIs in uh, Kiev. You see, this is going to please, this is going to please the, uh, the German NAZIs that are uh, in and around Alensky for them to have weapons on June 22nd. It's an optics, media, history kind of win for them, you know? And all these NAZIs sitting around Alensky are gonna say, oh, this is great. This is symbolic. This has meaning, the fact that Germany's gonna send us these howitzers on June 22nd. And the meaning behind getting these howitzers on June 22nd is that uh, the glory of uh, 
of the Bandera movement is now going to be able to push back the Russians on June 22nd. That's going to be the symbolic date for them. So they're throwing them a bone. They're kind of taking a poke at Russia, I imagine. The Collective West is trying to take a little bit of a media poke at Russia. The howitzers aren't going to make a difference, but um, I'm sure the NAZI is in, uh, in and around Elensky believe that they will, and the symbolism is not lost on them, nor is it going to be lost on the Russians. And uh, the Kremlin, they understand why the collective West is picking this date. They understand very, very well. Demilitarization and denazification. I wonder if that uh, only pertains to Ukraine or if the Kremlin is, is looking at a denazification and demilitarization of the collective West as well. We'll see. We will see. So with that being said, let me think here before I get to my clown world, if I have any more stories that I want to talk about. A lot of people have been asking me to comment about the fact that Nicaragua is authorizing the entry of Russian troops and planes to Nicaragua. Maria Zakharova said that uh, this is pretty routine stuff, no big deal, but we understand the symbolism there as well. And uh, the fact that uh, Stoltenberg came out with a statement like about a week, week and a half ago, and he said that uh, actually the deputy chair for uh, NATO, I forgot her name, but the office of Stoltenberg, the, the NATO head honcho, they said that every country is, uh, is, is allowed to choose whatever weapons they want to have on their territory with regards to Finland and Sweden, putting nukes on their territory, you know, the, the NATO head honcho, his office said, you know what, Finland and Sweden, they have the right to host whatever military they want, whatever equipment they want, it's their sovereign right. And so for Nicaragua to come along and say, you know what, we want, uh, we want Russian troops to, uh, to hang out in our country. That's what Daniel Ortega, the Nicaraguan president, said, that he's authorized Russian troops, planes, and ships to deploy to Nicaragua for purposes of training, law enforcement, or emergency response. Yeah. You know, Finland and Sweden can have uh, military and nukes and whatever else, uh, you know, you want to put there on their territory, and it's their sovereign right. Well... Nicaragua can do the same, and Mexico can do the same, and Cuba can do the same, and Venezuela can do the same. According to the rules of uh, Stoltenberg and NATO, every country has a sovereign right to host whatever military uh, weapons, installations, missiles, personnel that they want. So, yeah, you know, if those are the rules of the game, then those are the rules of the game. And, uh, you know, Russian Chinese troops should just start making their way towards uh, Latin America and... Uh, Cuba, why not? If it's good for Finland and Sweden, it's good enough for Nicaragua and Cuba and Venezuela and uh, any other countries that would like to host Chinese and Russian military and maybe even nukes. Why not? Put nukes in Finland? Why not put nukes in, uh, <laughs> in Mexico, in Venezuela? You know, it sounds, it sounds fair. It is fair when all is uh, said and done. Anyway, let's do two clown worlds. The first clown world that I want to talk about has to do with uh, the Michigan Police Department. And then I want to talk about a clown world with uh, regard, once again, to uh, Germany and how um, German citizens are, are skipping meals to save money. Actually, before I get to the clown world, there's one story that I forgot, and that's the, uh, the new G8. This is a quick story, but um, a Russian Duma speaker, the, Ru the Russian Duma speaker, has uh, Volodin has said that there's a new G8 that's forming, and the G8, he said this in a Telegram post, the G8 countries are, according to the Duma speaker, China, India, Russia, Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico, Iran, and Turkey. And he said that the group of uh, eight countries not, participate, not participating in the sanctions wars, China, India, Russia, Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico, Iran, Turkey, in terms of GDP, NPPP is 24.4% ahead of the old group, i.e. the G7 of the United States, Japan, Germany, Britain, France, Italy, and Canada. He says that those G7 countries continue to crack under the weight of sanctions imposed against Russia. He's right. I like the new G8. And that new G8 is much more powerful than the G7, especially going forward. Looking into the future, that G8 is uh, that's a pretty impressive uh, group of countries. They don't all get along. There are many of those countries in that list. They have problems between each other, but between the G, this new G8, say, and the BRICS, 
and uh, the SCO and all the other institutions being put together by China and China and Russia, you know, they're going to find a way to, uh, to fix the problems and the disputes between these countries and to put in place a multipolar new world order. And that new world order, like uh, Volodin states in his Telegram post, that's a pretty powerful block. That is a very powerful block. And I know that Turkey and Erdogan, they've been talking for a while now how the uh, Security Council does not represent the real um, power of, uh, the, 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 the real representation of countries that have power in, uh, in the world. It doesn't have uh, uh, real representation. It's still kind of a, a collective West construct. And uh, Turkey would, would like this G8 list as I'm sure Iran will, and well, China, India, Russia, Indonesia, a lot of representation from Asia and, uh, and the Middle East, which is, which is interesting, interesting, very, very um, interesting post from uh, the Russian Duma speaker on Telegram. And it's happening. It is happening. Now let's get to our clown world. And maybe for this clown world, we'll walk a little as well. Enough sitting down here let's walk one second everybody and we'll talk about michigan 911 restrictions and then we'll talk about let's take you to the front of the umbrellas here well, actually we'll just kind of walk under the umbrellas All right Beautiful sculpture. Let's go into our clown world. So in Michigan, the Sheriff's Department is reducing 911 calls due to exhausted funds for gas. <laughs> so the Sheriff in Michigan, wow, a very windy. So the Sheriff in Michigan, they are, uh, they're saying that, look, we just, uh, we've, we've gotten over budget with, uh, with our transportation and petrol costs and, um, we're just gonna have to try to respond to 911 calls over the phone <laughs> because the price of gas is too high and it's just costing too much to actually send police over to uh, to locations where they where they receive a 911 emergency phone call. And for those that are not in the U.S., the 911 is the emergency uh, phone number. It's the number that you call if you're in the United States to to call the police. Something bad is happening, you know, and you need you need police help. With regular gasoline prices climbing over $5 a gallon, a sheriff's office in Michigan announced that it has blown through its fuel budget and will avoid responding to non-urgent 911 calls. Isabelli County Sheriff's Office is feeling the pain at the pump as well. We have exhausted what funds were budgeted for fuel with several months to go before the budget reset. I have instructed the deputies to attempt to manage whatever calls are acceptable over phone, this would be non-in-progress calls, non-life-threatening calls, calls that do not require evidence collection or documentation. Okay, so fair enough, <laughs> fair enough. So the phone call, the person at the other end of the phone call is going to have to make a judgment call. The, uh, the dispatcher, they're gonna have to make a judgment call as to whether this 911 emergency warrants an actual police officer getting in their car, car, using petrol, and driving over to the scene of uh, of a possible crime, and so <laughs> they have to save on fuel costs, as we all do, as we all do. So, uh, real good job, uh, Bidenopolis, with those <laughs> with those devastating sanctions on Russia. Real good job. And now let's shift gears to Germany, as we're walking here on the port, and this is. The second clown world, which is saying that one in six Germans are skipping meals to save money, according to a recent poll. Nearly one in six Germans have been forced to skip meals regularly in order to make ends meet, according to a poll conducted earlier this week by the Institute for New Social Answers and published on Friday by the newspaper Build. Another 13% thir say they fear such a situation if the increase in food prices continue. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the hardest hit among the poll respondents were low-income households. 
those with monthly incomes of less than 1,000 euros, 32% of which have been regularly forced to skip meals for financial reasons. A significantly larger portion of poll respondents, 42%, say they had been forced to cook more sparingly due to financial hardship, either leaving out certain ingredients for meals or foregoing desserts. Almost as many, 41%, reported depending on special offers and discounts from supermarkets in order to get as much value from for their money as possible. So that was the poll there. No more fuel for 911. Um, <laughs> police to get to the scene of the crime. No more fuel there. Germans are cutting back on uh, on meals and ingredients, and um, yeah. And the collective West is winning this this economic war against Russia. Is that the narrative that uh, we're supposed to believe? And keep in mind, I say this often, but I'll say it again. Keep in mind that the Putin. Uh, administration that they have not really done anything in retaliation with all the sanctions the full maximum sanctions that uh, the collective west has thrown on them the russians still have not really retaliated the only thing we've gotten on the western side of things is gas for rubles that's it gas for rubles and a reciprocal closure of the airspace and they did that in reciprocity with as a retaliation to the closure of airspace for Russian aircrafts. Those are the only two actions that the Russians have taken towards the, uh, the collective West. That is it. So to be honest, it's pretty much just gas for rubles. That's pretty much the only thing they have done. So anyway, we will see. We will see what's going to happen come September, October. Like I've said many times, and I'll say it again, I think it's going to be the, uh, the Russians that are going to drop the, um, the Europeans when it comes to oil and uh, fertilizer and uh, all of those things. It's going to be the Russians that ditch the, uh, the Europeans come uh, September, October, not the Europeans ditching the Russians. And that is going to be a decisive blow. Anyway, we will leave the video there. I'm coming to you from Thessaloniki, Greece. And uh, check out Alexander's videos. Check out the Duran's videos as well and uh, go to the duran.locals.com. I am signing out from here on my second video update. Take care.